leave you with Prius here. They did a wonderful write-up on Vince. And we sure do miss Vince. And uh, it was, uh, you did a, a wonderful job. And if he was to be here, he'd say thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. And thank you for, because this is a policy something that's in the paper. And we need policy things in the paper with Mount Palmer. Okay, I'll turn it over to Emily. I am going to start with Jim Sullivan. He's from Safefield. One of the um, items we had on last month's agenda was to adopt the International Property Maintenance Codes. And just for clarification, he's here to um, help you all understand what that is, what that means, and how that's going to help him uh, do his job with safe build. So then he's going to be doing our code enforcement and building inspecting for Mount Carmel um, through safe build. And I think that adopting these codes will help him be more effective at his job. So I will turn it over uh, to you. Thank you, Emily. Excuse me, what was your last name again? Uh, Sullivan, as in the county. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, there you go. Uh, I'm sure I had Ken here, but it's, I'm, I'm from Boston originally. So first, let me introduce, yeah, let me introduce myself. I'm, I'm Jim Sullivan again, as Emily has told you. Um, just to give you a little quick background on me, I am uh, originally from New England, from Boston, Massachusetts, as I just told you. But I've been in Tennessee on this rotation since 2016. Um, my first trip to Tennessee was over to Fort Campbell, Kentucky, when I was in the Army. And I uh, fell in love with Tennessee being a New England boy, but uh, I, I never wanted to go back to New England, but I found home when I landed at Fort Campbell, and I've always, always loved Tennessee. So me and my wife, when we had the first opportunity, after my kids graduated from school and went off on their ways, we decided to come back to Tennessee. So I'm um, well, happy to be here. I appreciate that. So I've been here since 2016. Um, retired fire marshal out of the Alexandria Fire Department in Washington, D.C., and uh, retired from that opportunity and I had an opportunity to come down to, to Tennessee to become the building official <coughs> for Johnson City. So I used to run the Johnson City uh, uh, building department and I ran their building inspections uh, uh, division plus their uh, code enforcement division and I was also the zoning enforcement officer over there for a while as well. Um, decided to go out after I uh, served a short stint there to go out and open my own shop and I did. I opened up Sullivan Inspection Services, and um, I have uh, uh, applied for and received a couple of state contracts. Um, I also work um, as a contractor serving some of the local developers, providing code, uh, code consultations for, uh, for planning and development on their projects for new construction on residential and commercial properties throughout East Tennessee. So that's uh, one of the things that I did. But a couple of years ago, just to give you some more background on how what's the SafeBuilt tie-in, is that SafeBuilt is a national company that provides municipal services as a third-party agency. Um, and I've had a relationship with them for years. I've known them um, from going to conferences, and they provide, they provide services from everywhere from California all the way across the country to Georgia, and they're trying to work their way into Tennessee. Um, but they, they reached out to me several years ago and asked me to do commercial plan review for them. And I do uh, review of architectural and engineering drawings, um, mostly in the state of Virginia because I have licenses there as well. And I review uh, architectural and engineering drawings for code compliance um, for the issue permits in different jurisdictions over there. So when Vince passed away, um, Vince Fisher, we were just talking about Vince. Vince, I've been working with Vince professionally for years since I've been here. I've known Vince, and we've known each other professionally for a long time. Vince was reaching out to me a couple of years ago and was asking me if I'd be willing to help out. And I said, Vince, I'm pretty much at capacity, so I don't have the capacity to really reach out and to, to perform services for Mount Carmel, or Gwinesville. Plus, he had a state contract as a building inspector as well. And... Um, as you all know, he became suddenly ill and passed away not too long ago. And it left a lot of a lot of people in the lurch. So I had Emily reached out to me, uh, Megan Gentry down in Sergoinsville. I've got Mountain City uh, reached out to me, Town of Unicoi reached out to me. I had everybody calling me because apparently I'm the other building inspector in the area in East Tennessee. So 
a lot of people were asking if Sullivan Inspection Services could support it. And uh, quickly I realized that I did not have the capacity internally, just myself, to do all of this on my own. So I reached out to uh, SafeBelt, who I've already got a contract with, and I said, I'd like to team up with you and to bring you guys in because um, you can provide me the, the back of the back network and the support um, to provide some additional staffing so that we can support these jurisdictions and uh, get them get them set up under the safe built umbrella. So that was my approach to, uh, to Emily and to Megan and to Goinsville and Mountain City. We are now under contract with those three jurisdictions working on a few others. And I've got uh, I've also got some other staff that we're working on hiring and bringing on board to provide uh, building inspection services, plumbing inspection services, HVAC inspection services, and code enforcement for uh, for the jurisdictions. So that's sort of the background of how Safefield got here. I just thought I wanted to share with you kind of how that how that came to be. Um, one of the things I've approached uh, the the jurisdictions with is that are interested in code enforcement, and Mount Carmel certainly is one of them, so is Mountain City and Sir Goinsville, is that in order for us to be effective um, in code enforcement, there's a standard, there's a national code called the International Property Maintenance Code. Um, most of your smaller jurisdictions in Tennessee have not adopted the International Proper, Property Maintenance Code. Your larger jurisdictions, City of Kingsport, City of Johnson City, City of Bristol, all have adopted the International Property Maintenance Code, and it's a national standard for uh, um, for the uh, administration of property maintenance in the jurisdiction. The reason I the reason I want to get that adopted by all the other jurisdictions is because it provides us a uniform code that we can write notices of violation under. Uh, the courts recognize it. Uh, attorneys are familiar with it. And, and when these cases um, for property maintenance, for such as tall grass, uh, trash in the yard, hoarding situations, or animal hoarding situations, a lot of those situations are addressed by the property maintenance code under a universal code uh, under universal code language. And the uh, we're we're bringing in software to all of the jurisdictions that we serve with SafeBuilt, and that software is built upon the International Property Maintenance Code. Uh, language. So when we issue a national, when we issue a notice of violation, which is a legal notice, if the township has adopted the International Property Maintenance Code, then I can cite that code legally, and that'll be uh, that'll be the basis for the, uh, the notice of violation and bringing that to a bank. So it's important for us to have that that language and that code adopted so that we can proceed. Uh, these cases hopefully don't go into court, but I assume that every every notice of violation that I write is going to go to court and come into a <coughs> chance to do it. When it does, the township, if they've adopted that international property maintenance code, we're in good shape. So that's, that's the importance of it. Does it change? Uh, one of the questions that I get, and I was just talking to Mr. Goinsville, does it really change any of the, uh, uh, the enforcement mechanisms that are in place? The answer is no, it doesn't. It's very broad, it's very broad based uh, language that's inside of that, but it is structured. It's got a specific national structure for how those codes are written, and those code sections are what we can cite. Um, that's in the International Property Maintenance Code, and those code sections are tied to our software. So, for, for example, if I issue a tall grass or trash complaint, I'll cite the International Property Maintenance Code, and that's already built into the software. We don't have to, you don't have to do anything you know, special or handwriting. It'll just be built right into that, and we can issue it, issue those uh, notices that way. So it works with the software that we're going to be adopting as well. So um, the other question I got was chicken ordinances. I, I know that comes up a lot of times. I have, yeah. uh, I've dealt with, I've dealt with chickens uh, in Johnson City. It seemed like. I had no idea that I'd be dealing with chickens as much as I did, but I dealt with chickens quite a bit. But I had a couple of conversations about chickens here in Mount Carmel. Yep, yep. So the property maintenance code does not address chickens per se. Uh, that's a health. That's a health and safety ordinance that is uh, that's adopted separately in your code. So when somebody calls us and complains about it, if they're on their porch and messing it up and all that stuff, then we have to refer them to. It'll come to the code enforcement. So, and, and what we'll do is we'll we'll address that as a code enforcement case. So, if we get a complaint that becomes a case, 
and it goes into our software. We start that software. We'll send out an officer, a code enforcement officer, either myself or one of my staff. We'll send them out. They've got the software. They'll go out and they'll do an investigation on that complaint um, and um, determine whether or not it's a violation of the property maintenance code. If it is, then the next step is we issue a notice of violation. That goes to the registered owner of the property, and they receive a copy of that notice, and they're given 30 days, basically, to bring it into compliance unless it's a, an emergency situation. If it's an emergency situation, it may be a shorter period of time where we may have to take immediate action. If we've got a uh, situation where I've got a building that's about to collapse or something like that, um, in that case, I'll get with the fire chief and we'll, 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 we'll take immediate action on those. But typically, these are property maintenance cases where it's animal hoarding, tall grass and trash, general cleanup of the property, that kind of thing. But we issue that notice of violation. They're given a period of time to get into compliance with that. If they fail to get into compliance with that, then we issue a citation to come to court. I know we're working on bringing in a new municipal court judge. Um, that becomes a court case. And when I go to court, the basis of that complaint in court is the notice of violation that we've issued through the property maintenance code. And we go into court and we testify uh, in court that uh, we've witnessed this violation. They have failed, they've been given a legal notice. They failed to come into compliance. And we're going to ask the judge for relief on that. And that's, that's basically where the fines start to come in. And I understand that we've adopted in the municipal code a $50 per day fine. Um, which is important, and I'm glad that you've done that. Johnson City had not done that, and that was rather painful. So it's fifty dollars per offense, and so people would just pay the offense. They'd pay the fifty dollars and move on. They'd have to start all over again every time that happened. But we have a fifty dollar per day uh, charge that we can we can charge folks with. That gets to be expensive quickly, so people tend to get into compliance. So what about the mail though? Grandfather calls and all this any of this stuff. Um, it's a maintenance code. So this is a uh, property maintenance code is based on basic standards of living for dwelling units and for commercial property. So um, you can't grandfather in, for example, an electrical hazard if you've got something that's going to pose a electrical hazard. Chickens. Oh, chickens, yeah. And environmentalists. Because you've got both in this town. Right. And right. You know who that is. <laughs> so if you run for your money, I'll tell you that. No, right. I got you. I got you. No, then what do you do in a case like this? It's been that way for years and years and years. If it's a violation of the property maintenance code, then these are minimum standards. So we'll issue that notice of violation. And if they, they've got to bring it into compliance. So, um, for example, I mean, this, these are things like if your grass is over 12 inches tall, and you're not maintaining your grass, then that's something that it's not grandfathered in. But if you've got, um, if you've got a bill, I'm trying to think of a good situation. If you've got an older building and it's got knob and tube wiring in there, um, that knob and tube wiring, if it's maintained in a safe condition, is fine. You can have that there. If it becomes an electrical hazard and it's creating a, a potential hazard, then we're going to cite that under the property maintenance code because it's no longer, no longer as it was designed safely, but it's become a hazard, so we're gonna have to have to, have to address that. So I think, hopefully that answers your question. I think Jim's trying to get to the point where there's some uh, movement about for natural landscaping. I mean, they've experienced using the uh, property maintenance code to uh, <coughs> somebody say it's natural landscaping that they- Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, as opposed to not maintaining the yard? Exactly, they don't say they're they're doing uh, around the trees for uh, butterflies, let's say, whatever you may have. And that becomes a difficult situation. Obviously, something the judge has to eventually decide, but how would you handle that if somebody did? I try to use as much discretion as you can on that. So, there are one man's, one, so one man's junk pile is another man's treasure pile. So, and that's fair. Um, so the intent, the intent behind landscaping and I'll tell you, that this is a conversation I've had many times. The intention behind the landscaping of the tall grass is rodent harborage. That's the biggest issue. So there are people that have natural landscaping, and that's fine. And you can have natural landscaping, and I'll, and I'll, I'll agree with that. I'll entertain that conversation. If it's harboring rodents, 
and I'm getting rats or I'm getting snakes or I'm getting burned, mm -hmm. then it's no longer a natural landscaping issue, it's a road and harbor issue, and it becomes a health and safety issue. So. One last question. Is there any mechanism to opt out of any provisions of the code in your system? To opt out of it? I, I, example, it says you can have uh, two pets. Or, does that get involved in your It system? does not. Okay, yeah, so we're not going to code Let's just say if somebody says they want to have uh, 13 inch grass. What? 13 inch grass. Or so 12 inches was the. Uh, yeah, <laughs> 13 inch grass. Just something right. Like, so. Yeah, well, 12 inches is our standard. So if it's not being maintained beyond 12 inches, we'll issue a notice and cut that down. Who would be okay. monitoring that then? What's that? Who would be monitoring the dry stand? We all be driving around looking for that, or uh, so we're gonna we're gonna generally um, for the smaller jurisdictions we're complaint driven. So I'm, I'm not, not, we're not looking for proactive code enforcement. Okay. We're going to be dealing with uh, in these jurisdictions. Um, in Johnson City, they have proactive code enforcement where they do literally drive around and they look at they look for tall grass and they look for trash. Right, and that's 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 a, that becomes a budgeting issue. So um, typically, um, in my smaller jurisdictions, I do this on a complaint-driven basis, okay. and unless I've received a complaint. I'm not going to. I'm not going out to, to start trouble, <laughs> if you will, with folks. And what you say about the rats would be a what would be? It's called rodent harborage. So, um, if you're if you if you've got rats, snakes, um, if you've got issues with the landscaping that it provides harbor for those types of creatures, that creates a nuisance, and that's a uh, that's a nuisance under the property management code. But it's a conversation that I've had in the past. Where I've had people say, "Well, this is this is my landscape plan, and this is what I'm doing," and like I said, I'll try to work with them on that as much as possible. But if it's creating a road and harborage issue, or I've got snakes, and I've got other issues that I'm dealing with, that creates a hazard for the for the community. So I can just imagine that there's maybe a provision of the maintenance code that the board doesn't feel they want to uh, modify or change, whatever is a number or whatever. Is there an option in your system for that for them to do that? Yes. Yeah, we can. We can. Yeah, if we've got if we've got a section of the code that we don't want to okay. enforce, we can we can certainly amend <coughs> that code. That's my point. Is yeah, that, they, could, they could customize it. Yeah, we can amend it if we need that. We need it. Um, generally, I'll tell you, I, my experience. I've worked with it for 25 years. I've worked with the property maintenance code. The really the key to this the, the key to success on this thing is that the code enforcement officers have discretion. And you've got to have people that are that are willing to go out and to have these conversations about the landscaping and try to work through the resolutions on these problems. Um, code enforcement can be difficult because it often it can oftentimes become a yard battle between neighbors, and they're trying to beat each other over the head sometimes, and that that happens. And so I've I've negotiated that several times, and I've realized rapidly that these people just don't like each other, <laughs> and that they're looking to looking to beat each other up by complaining to the city about some of that stuff. So um, trying to trying to get through that and, and resolve those issues sometimes is part of this too. So you become a bit of a social worker when you're involved in this. So. Um, we also get tied in just just to give you some other background. A lot of these cases. Um, sometimes will involve adult protective services for uh, folks that are older um, and are unable to take care of their property that are aging in place. Um, it may involve animal control. Um, so these cases oftentimes involve animal control officers coming out for animal hunting situations, child protective services, and mental health services. So I work with all of those agencies and I try to bring all of that to the table when I have those cases. And the, the goal of these property maintenance cases is to resolve the issue, uh, is, the, is the thing. I'm not necessarily the hammer. I'm here to resolve the issue and make it better for the community um, that's, that's adversely affected by the situation. So. When you, you as other of you, some of these colleagues passed this, you said um, Cervantesville has already passed this? Cervantesville had their first reading the other night. Has, um, when they did pass that, was there, I mean, is there any? Common issue that you run into, um, as one of these colleagues, I'm kind of just quickly glancing through the, the code I'm on here. I mean, it looks sure. like pretty pretty basic type stuff. I mean, the I can see how some of the language then becomes has to be facilitated by a judge to make the call. What is what is adequate? You know, yep. that becomes the, it's very broad. Yeah, it's, it's very broad. Very, very broad. But I mean, just 
Uh, but I also think it's important what Mr. Cal pointed out about how if there was something on there that we wanted to uh, not enforce. So I imagine we wouldn't want to tailor it because it's not the international one. It's not that version. It's either right. enforce it or not. Right. It would be kind of what that we would look to, to right. do. Um, but yeah, I think that's, was there, but is there any like common issues or that you run into in small municipalities with the adoption of it? I have not. I think general concerns have been uh, chickens again. Was the was the big conversation I had in so going the, the state actually might be taking intervening in that because yeah. I thought there's some legislation going through this year about um, like removing the ability for municipalities to limit that. No, really? I don't, I've not heard I, of that. One. No. Something I, I thought I saw no. in the news. Article. We had a chicken ordinance in, in Johnson City. We did we, we we did not allow you to have roosters inside the city. Um, it's considered yeah. a nuisance animal. Um, and they had a, that, but that was under their health ordinance. It wasn't part of the property maintenance. Center. I was also the health officer. Yeah, so yeah, I see like my guy wore every hat. And <laughs> and there. But, so that's that's outside of the property maintenance. Kind of, but uh, we can certainly deal with a dirty chicken coop not being maintained in sanitary conditions. That's the kind of thing that we're going to deal with under the uh, under that property maintenance code. So, what does the property enforcement code deal with? Abandoned buildings or unkept properties, and that's not been used in 22 years. Or so there's an annex actually to that, and that's um, they they've got a, a provision in there where the city has authorized to go in and board up those properties and to secure them um, if they're becoming a attractive nuisance or a potential nuisance of, of danger. Under the property maintenance code, if it's severe enough, uh, you can order a property demolished. Um, and that's that's going to end up going through um, the process. But as the property maintenance official, I can order a property to be taken down if it presents a, uh, a structural or pre presents a, a collapse hazard or an immediate hazard to life and, life and health. In Johnson City, I, I've actually uh, ordered the uh, the raising of several uh, dwelling units that were abandoned were in such severe condition that they uh, they need to be torn down. And the way we did that, that's another mechanism, but we, we actually got into that through our public works department. We would tear down that structure and we would assess a lien on the property. Um, and that lien would go on to the taxes uh, through the county. And that's, that's, how that was, that's how those uh, costs were assessed. Doesn't that also apply to business? It does. It does. And the property name is code of, applies to both residential and commercial property. So it's a powerful tool. It's a very powerful tool. But um, you've got to use it judiciously, so that's the key. So very carefully. Like I said, I've been doing this for a long time, so I, I, I've seen, the, seen some of the traps of that. So you've got to be careful with it. But um, yeah, in Johnson City, I think uh, we, uh, we had to take care of quite a bit of property. It was, um, it was literally, I mean, fading in, falling down. Kids weren't getting into them, they were unsecure. That kind of a situation. And you've got to make a, a pretty good case before you can before you can get there. And there's obviously a notice uh, a notice period that you've got to go through and a hearing period that's got to be provided for that in the property maintenance code. There needs to be public hearings on that, and then before that order is made, and then it goes to court, and, and the judge needs to be aware of that as well too. So what is the what is that timeline? I mean, I know it varies. But when you have the civil report in there, it varies. The timeline can drastically vary. But what does your time's line of a case look like from complaint to resolution? So typically, it? typically the notice of violation is issued. It's a 30-day compliance period to get involved with that. If that doesn't happen, then we're going to go to the municipal court and issue notice to that um, that the that notice that the uh, notice of violation has not been complied with. We've got to get into in front of municipal court depending on the court's schedule. That's typically typically another uh, two weeks to 30 days to get onto the court docket, and then the judge will make his uh, his decision as well. And then and we're we're dealing with uh, judicial actions. But the municipal court uh, judge is really limited to what they can do. It's a 50 dollar day fine that type of thing. They also have an automatic way to, to appeal it to the circuit court or the chancery court. The chancery court. And that's when you would draw again the line of six months, nine months. Okay. Yeah. That's where the, the yeah. time line really right. drastically. So you out. hope that your case is so strong that you can convince did that procedure with the 
two houses in Somo Hollow and up in the hill there. Mm -hmm. And that's what he did. And he went through the whole process and it didn't go to, uh, you know, to any length he put up. But I guess what I'm saying is he's correct. It's fairly quick in the beginning, but it can slow down real fast. Yeah, if you get in if you get in a chance to record it in the PMs, I can go on for a while. Yeah, yeah. But the fifty dollar day fine is very helpful. And that's something that puts you guys uh, ahead of the game um, because that adds up very quickly at fifty dollars a day for the, for the violation. So most of the time the property's not worth <laughs> well that's it's that, worth sentimental value and right, right. Yeah. You but get, I, the county doesn't even get their taxes out of level and you get your lien tearing it down. So yeah. unless you get lucky and have one of the developer clients buy them up to right. you know rehab them or something like that. And market forces are starting to play well here. So there's a, there's a huge demand for property. And I'll tell you that if you ever go down to the auction uh, for the county share sales um, for, uh, for properties being auctioned off, there is a, a group of investors that are at every one of those, and they're 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 shopping the bottom of the market um, for development on those properties. So there's, there's, there's quite a bit of demand for that. Well, so, yeah. I mean, you gotta wait a year though. Yeah, you do have to wait a year. So yeah, that's right. But, I've got uh, I've got a couple guys in Johnson it's City. I had a, what's that? It's been officially wiped that year. Though. Yeah, yeah. But I've got a couple guys in, in Johnson City that uh, I got to know them well. They were at all of my hearings, and they were just waiting. They were, were waiting just to see if they could get their hands on these properties. They wanted to know which which properties were distressed, because the owners would be at those hearings, and I'd watch them. And during the breaks, they'd go over and talk to the owners, try to make cash offers. And, so I mean that's part of part of the point of this is to put the pressure on the owners to do something with the property, and sometimes the answer is for them to sell. It. <coughs> and is this replacing anything currently, or are we just adopting this as the new standard? No, it's replacing uh, all the orders. I assume you guys are sort of newly hooked. Where you have now? You have, we have we something have, to adopt have, at this point. We have uh, basically the, the local ordinance is Title 13 of the municipal code. So this is going to be in addition to that. Yeah, so we're not actually we're not actually replacing this. We're adopting this as the municipal code for property maintenance. The Title 13 still remains in place, which gives us a lot of the administrative procedures. So that's fine. All right. Any else? Not me. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I would I would like to say. I would appreciate it hearing you say that you tried to work with the people, especially if it would be someone who's sick or elderly and can't do for themselves anymore because that's, that's a hard blow to anybody. These cases can be very hard. They can really be hard. I, and I've, I've worked with Adult Protective Services on a bunch of these and Child Protective Services and Animal Control. But yeah, a lot of this, many of these cases involve mental health issues. So they they can be they can be complicated. You've got to bring the social services in and help bring this That's kind of good now. Well, there's a I met a lady a couple weeks ago when I had to go to the Johnson City with the uh, other mayor's meetings, and I met a lady there that there is an organization. She said that they would do uh, like if they needed the men couldn't get out and mow the yard, or yeah. if they couldn't. Uh, clean her house or whatever, and I've got the, all those numbers. And, uh, I've got those numbers because I thought I'd, uh, that I knew some people that could use that, that help to clean house or go shopping and leave their husband if they were sick or whatever. And so let me know if you want the, the number, and I'll give it to you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. You don't have to study. Oh, that, that's all good. That's all good. I'll roll out. But it's nice to meet you all, and I'll see you. See you around. <coughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Take care. See you. Now. Take care. All right. So that's going to go back to the agenda for this month. It'll still take two readings, but as long as everybody feels comfortable voting with it, the quicker we get that passed, the quicker they can start doing the enforcement on these problematic properties. Can you bring that up to the next meeting or do we have to? Yeah, it's going to go back on the agenda because it was paid, just tabled okay. for this. So. Okay. Um, I, I'll, the only other thing that I have is the budget, which we can go over or we can do that at the end. It's, it's at your discretion.
Go ahead and go through. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So I've emailed out, and then I've also passed out a hard copy of the actual budget, line item budget. But rather than going <clears throat> line item by line item, I thought it might be more effective to just hit the major projects and <coughs> purchases that have been requested. So, um, well, at first glance, we have a balanced budget. We got our financial numbers for, our, for um, we got our financial statements for the fiscal year 23 um, audit, and we have a very healthy fund balance of over $8 million. Um, so everything looks good. There's no issues. Um, I think the theme of this year is looking like the same as last year where we're trying to make these improvements to our own facilities. So, um, you know, we budgeted for signs last year. We've, we've got those in process right now. Um, one of the big things that I think we need to look at and I have budgeted for is facade improvements for City Hall. So redoing uh, or changing out the lighting at the front. Um, we need to take down the flag holes that are at the top, uh, replace the doors because they're just old and um, just making some updates to City Hall. One of the things that I had talked to a contractor about is actually changing the whole look of the outside of the building by doing either a lime wash or um, actually the contractor had mentioned possibly doing like a darker navy or black. Um, it's not paint, but it's some sort of adhesion to the built to the brick and then having wooden accents. And I was hoping he would have the digital renderings of that done so I could show you all. But um, he, he said he would get those to me next week. And that's obviously in the future, we can discuss that further. But just doing something to improve the looks of City Hall, updating the outside <coughs> of it, because I think that ultimately that holds us back from getting businesses in here. They don't see our buy-in on the front end and you know, therefore it's hard to you know, sell coming here and setting up shop. Well, and tosses other people also to make their buildings look a lot better. Right, yes. Ooh, so huge. <laughs> so uh, that, that's been The only good. thing that, uh, can I say, <coughs> say that, uh, is like the speeders that still come down here, I, it scares me that when we back out and everything, because they're right on the port when they come down that hill, mm -hmm. We need to just be get something like right there and a good, yeah. uh, and I think at night have a, a good maybe spotlight on what the when you get the improvements because I think that would help the people will look how nice Mount Homer looks. Yes, yeah. yeah. and but yeah. and but we still need to to put a, I think a sign up that's flashing all the time up there. Mm -hmm. At least twenty five miles an hour. Well, they tried that once. Didn't work. Well, they didn't. There wasn't a flashing light up there. Yes, they were. No. Mm -hmm. Just all of it. It was up there. No. Okay. I ain't gonna argue with you. My eyes didn't lie. Was there one up there, Emily? It was. Uh, it a I believe it was a speeding sign that showed your actual speed. I think that's what it was. Speeding sign. I like that. Yeah. No. Because it's dangerous for you all to go across that road right there. The way. What are you talking about the? Up on the hill right up here? Yep. Yeah. It had that little like reflective light on top of it, didn't it, Jim? It wasn't a blinker, but it had that like reflective yellow. It, well, it was a light at nighttime, it was flash. And daytime, you could see it, it was lit. I don't know what happened. Did somebody hit it or maybe the maintenance took it down? I don't know. I mean, we can definitely look into that, that sort of thing and revisit. You know, is there a need for speed bumps? Is there a need for? I think for... there needs to be a speed bump up there because I mean, it, it would slow them down. Yeah, it would really slow them down. And yeah, 
If they say, well, it tore up my car, well, you had no business to come down the hill like that. Yeah. Well, you know, we went through these speed yeah, we went before, by, went, we went before. one of the things come up people on motorcycles, it can cause them to have a big kill on the speed bumps. I think there's a lot of different alternatives that we can look into, but I feel like that might be a separate discussion from just the budget right now so we'll we can definitely look at doing something like that um i don't I mean, think it's just not you all it's anybody that pulls in here to come in to pay a fine mm -hmm. or to the, the court or go into the uh, uh the mail over here the yeah. post office and and they back out and wham they're on them yeah i'm surprised we haven't had a lot of wrecks right there yeah and then they try to, to beat the fly of the red light too to fly down through there because they scream the flying down there so it wouldn't come red and hold them back. Yeah. So all these other departments like the police department, our department. For improvements yeah. there. Um okay, so we'll we'll just start with the our budget at City Hall or the administration. So we want to do facade improvements at City Hall. Um we want to possibly, I think the primary focus is going to be the outside of the building and if there's additional monies left over from what has been budgeted, then we would like to redo the floors in here and reconfigure the courtroom or do something like uh, not the tables. Somehow set up the boardroom to be more professional. Um, and just update it. I mean, I know we did the painting and stuff, but I feel like the tables, we could make it more professional in here. Okay. So it's pretty good. The floors? When it comes to spending money, that floor's fine for people coming here and going to court. Okay. Well, these, well, these but it's uh, just an option. You you guys vote on these it. These tables were just about probably four years ago mm -hmm. uh, when Mike was here because the skirts are on them. And that's what we really do need that because when we wire dressing here. Mm -hmm. We don't have to do any of that. It is just purely a suggestion. Yeah. I, um, I agree with the, out, the outside of the building is it's dark. Yeah, it's, it's very it's outdated. Yeah, very you outdated. Do the windows too? Put new windows in or? Uh... Probably not. I think the windows are fine. The doors are definitely in need of replacement for here and the post office. Um, but I think just the whole appearance of the outside of the building needs to be updated, brought to more modern, um, I don't think decor is the right word, but just modernize the outside the of it, the lights. Yeah. The yes, the appearance just really needs to be strong. I see a lot of people painting their bricks white now. A lot of houses, they look really nice. It don't last that long. It don't. <laughs> If, yeah. the way this is budgeted, so the way this is budgeted, if uh, you know, if there's money left over from the outside, and talk about doing improvements in here. Yes. If um, you know, if we didn't look at doing the floor or something like that, um, is in that same type of line item, could that be used for something like possibly even like a projector in here, so that you could rock, yes. that you could have the agenda on that wall or something that the audience could see. Yeah. Uh, or something, you know, just enhancements right right on right here. Enhance yeah. along those lines as well. Yeah. I feel like if we have money left over in this budget, what we would do is just come back to the board and determine how to spend it after we made the initial improvement. So if you would prefer to do some, you know, technology updates in here, we could do that. Just, pri you know, prioritizing those things. Um, however the board sees fit. I feel like that's, um, you know, I've been to a lot of different meetings where they do have the agenda or whatever their, this same type of document would be up on the screen that everybody can take a look at yeah. it of just, uh, just us here. And I think that would be, you know, for, for the cost of the projector for a couple hundred dollars, that would be worth the, uh, yeah. have that ability to do. And you've got a nice big white wall over there. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, I think that would be something to, you know, put a pin and look into. And not only that, John, we can, when people does our presentations to us, since they're looking at that little screen. That's very true. I think they need speakers. Anyway. 
We do need the, uh, and there's a whole lot of people in here, and there are eleven papers or forty books that have that. I can't hear John over there, and it's my hearing. I know, but, but anyway, we need our microphones back. That's what we have to have the system. The, yeah. the speakers are upstairs. The mic to down here without those, without the actual speakers, they they don't work. Well, can we not bring them down here? We don't have speakers. It's just the microphone. We're going to do something to, so that they can also hear as well as we can hear each other. Do we have speakers up there? Two of them? So they're probably still out there now. Probably two. Mm -hmm. How are they? Are they wired in? They're probably wired in up there too, aren't they? Hard wired. Yeah. So you have to run the wire. If you want to run the wire, you might as well get. Yeah, I guess it's. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or Bluetooth. Yeah. Bluetooth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. What about right here up on the bottom wall, the big room, the big room and exercise room, and there's one sitting on top of, of our brand new refrigerator? Yeah, I mean, I would get Bluetooth one. That way you don't have to worry about running the wires in it. Yeah. yeah we need I just to. think of speakers and microphone. I don't care about the microphone. Sometimes I can't hear what you guys are saying down there, and I got back on here and hear it. Still can't hear it. Well, I, I need them so, but I can't, I can't hear them sometimes, and I don't know that they get everybody because I can't hear them. So everything that you have on this list is budgeted. Yes. Yes. <laughs> everything that's on the list has been already factored into our budget and is balanced. So the budgeted um, up to five percent increase for full-time employees is that going to be based off their performance, or is that up to like the? So the, how how can we handle that last year? We have performance based, like how well plus performance based and. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've well, well, got one quick question about that. When we did it that way, I know you handled the performance base for majority of, or for the department heads handled their employees, you did department heads. We never did an evaluation with you, so did you, did you just get stuck with COLA last year? Yes. Okay. So if that's the case, then I wouldn't, I would want to make sure that that's fair to everybody. It's that she didn't even get the review and only got the COLA. Were you the only person that you didn't get the COLA? They just got pulled? Yes. Okay. Well, how did the evaluation work this year? Did it work okay? The step system that we recommended? Like, so they could get a raise and they did a really good job. Get a, uh, they got the 5% that they got. Again, <coughs> additional. Yeah. So and last year, everybody got a 3% and up to 3% based on performance <laughs> review. <laughs> ended up being at a 2%, I think, so it was five for pretty much everybody. And then this year, we just sent out our performance reviews last week, maybe, so I haven't gotten anybody's okay. back yet, and I haven't even started on mine yet. I feel like we still have some time for that, but um, I know it's important to do the performance reviews I don't know that it's necessary to tie it to increases. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's definitely would incentivize people, but I also feel like sometimes when it's tied to the increase, you may not get the feedback that you want to get, if that makes sense. So, you know, you, everybody wants to make sure they get a certain percent, so they might just be filling out the evaluations to ensure that that happens versus truly giving an evaluation on the performance, giving measurements to, you know, uh, help the person just be a better employee. So. Well, this is true, and, and also this is just how we're budgeting right now, I and mean, we can look at how you want to do that in July 1. Yeah. Right? That's when I would take, or June, okay. the June meeting, so we'll yeah. take effect July 1. Right? Yeah. This is just a, Broad, shell. Shell yes, right. so it, it's it's going to turn out however the board sees fit for it to turn what, out. What's the in hot uh, in house hot mix for the product? What is, what would that uh, be versus what we're doing now? So last year we the public works department purchased a hot box and it's 
so that you can take your hot mix for patching potholes or uh, building curbs. Um, historically, our public works director would go and pick up the mix and it would just be on the flatbed truck as, until it cooled off and then was not usable. So with the hot box, you can turn it on. It keeps the mix at the correct temperature for the concrete, or not concrete, but the yeah, asphalt right. to come out and um, be more effective when you put it down yeah, and well, it absorbs. Yes. I guess the question so, I have is, you bought the box already? Yes. yes, so now we'll be able to use it and patch our own holes versus contracting that out with um, Hey, so this is just a change in the budget. It's why yes. you cut. Okay, yeah. I'm sorry. That's, so that's ultimately what I was looking at. I was wanting to understand how this was a oh, okay, purchase so, item. Was because I, was like, what, I thought we already bought that. That's uh, Yes. Uh, I guess to clarify that that department, we I think there's 50000 Let me just double check. In that paving line item. And that 50000 is strict. It is. So it's in 931 and it's paving under State Street A. That 50,000 is gonna to go to our in-house work. So we're to use the hot box, getting the mix, doing repairs, so and things should, like that. So that should actually like stretch that 50,000 substantially further because we were probably losing some hot mix yeah. and cooling off. Yeah. So now we're gonna be able to pay, essentially pay ourselves to uh, yeah. buy it from here to do it ourselves to stretch that further. It also stretches out our paving budget because we were using money out of our paving budget to fix those holes. So now we have designated, we've got $300,000 in highways and streets under 931 paving, and that's gonna go towards um, either paving sections of Hammond and Independence over five years to complete both roads, um, or, and or, if funding allowed, um, doing the streets listed below, Atlanta, Walnut, Dover, and Holston. Those were the <clears throat> streets that Jason felt like needed to be looked at. Um, we got price quotes on each of those streets. Um, so I think it's gonna be an either or section, but I do recall last year when we discussed paving Hammond, we had the board had talked about focusing on Hammond and Independence, and I know it's not realistic for us to just pave all of Hammond or all of Independence because it was going to be over a million dollars. But if we did sections of each road, I think we could hit the whole thing in five years. Mm -hmm. So it, it would be a commitment, but um, we would get it done. I think. Well, um... <coughs> My only concern with the, the five-year commitment on that is that the, uh, the exponential changes that you can see are pricing of mm -hmm. asphalt. Yeah. Because what's that? I mean, this is these prices are probably up drastically from what they were a couple of years ago. I think so too. And they're not going to yeah. I mean, they're not going to go down. Yeah. So it's like I don't think we're going to try to maximize as much as we can at the price point we can currently. Mm -hmm. under, with the understanding that it's going to take five years to do it. Yeah. Um, but did Jason kind of give us a, a grade, or could we get a grade on these ranked from worst from, um, I guess I could take a look at them each and uh, to assess it, but Jason's opinion of what's the most needs improvement versus could be what held off on? Well, it's pretty bad. Well, I would say Holston, it's got a grass growing through the cracks. So that's pretty bad. Yeah. That's, mm -hmm. Well, um, Walnut Street. Walnut Street's over on Kingsport. Kingsport size. Kingsport. No, I mean, it, they've got a pothole that will take you to the center of the earth. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's... Is that, is that on Kingsport size? Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's like Walnut Street. Street. Yeah. Actually, yeah. that pothole you're referencing, we found out this week, actually belongs to ETSU. Kingsport tried to maintain that area of road, but it actually belongs to, is it ETSU or Northeast? ETSU. It belongs to ETSU. Well, yeah, mm -hmm. not Kingsport. Uh, you know, they, that little section of road of Walnut gets a lot of traffic. Mm -hmm. And it gets really probably more traffic that way than it coming up from the main street uh, past your house. Yep. But, uh, and then when uh, 
when they come out of Walnuts and see them, the uh, uh, street that goes up the Independence, this that part gets heavy, heavy traffic. And of course, we get heavy traffic on that road and this road here too, because from the valley up that way, they come at Independence and then down the valley this way to get out, they come Arabs. I, I mean Arabs. I'm not talking about Arab Hammond, Hammond Avenue. But that, that's actually <coughs> more traffic there than, uh, you know, from one that's up that way to do that first. But to me, it would be more simple because I had a call this week or two, last week or something that I find out about that right there in front of Ponderosa, the term. I know you've had probably right there some complaints too. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, that really is the, one of the first things that probably needs to be done right there because I get a lot of calls on that but from people in Ponderosa. Mm -hmm. So it's dangerous to come out of Ponderosa. I think it's part of, what is it, independent? Spruce or pop? Spruce, spruce on board. Uh, so are you saying that Kingsport is wanting to say that little stretch of road <coughs> is actually part of their parking lot? Pretty much I did not speak to Kingsport on this. This came from an individual who had called us, and it's clearly not in the city limits, and he knew that too. But he came back in to let us know that it, was, it belonged to ETSU. So we give, cannot. Give Kingsport time. Well, uh, let me just say this. The Kingsport City Police had um, people stopping on that road before to check. Getting tickets. Huh? Get tickets. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, in the, they were looking it's in the city limits of Kingsport, but they're not maintaining that road. I think that's, I think it's actually like a private, that section it probably has some, or something. But was, uh, was uh, one, did the one exit before they put the heat? The oh, up there. Ago. I was thinking it was. I'm not sure. Wall comes out now and connects to the yeah. university yeah. center. Yeah. And there was, I'm sure, a big development that we're putting the university center in there. I'm just wondering, was there a connection outward uh, before? I, I, That's before I, my time. Who donated that land? Well, somebody donated it, and then, like you said, so there might be some kind of private agreement in the plat and the restrictions for the, the university center. The main so, that owns the, the entry yeah. question. Uh, mm -hmm. Forward to the university was built. Walnut Street ended. That's the first one. Okay. Walnut Street ended. Then the city bought that property. I'm going to say the ATSU bought the property from the city to build a college. And the college actually is the one that had them as really the university boulevard. Which is the road coming from Stone Grounds Round to the University. So where it is. Well, the folks that own Allen Air Mansion, they own that and they owned all that land. And that was the stipulation to give that is to uh, get a uh, <coughs> some kind of educational yeah. place. I'm just saying there's probably there. something in the original development that would indicate who owns it and who may have the responsibility for maintaining it. That's all. Okay, I'm just going to go through each department. So we, we've got through administration, we'll hit the police and, and fire department. Um, the building over there is in need of some repairs. We've already started. Um, <laughs> <laughs> looking at replacing the metal on the outside of that building that has rusted through and has holes in it so that's coming out of this year's budget but um, as far as the inside of that department the fire side needs uh, some painting and updating on that side the police side actually needs to be finished there had been a project started over there for reconfiguring and it did not get completed so we're going to complete that and then also paint the fire side and update their training room. Um, so that's a, the purchase in, uh, it's coded under the facility repair and maintenance for police and fire. We kind of just split the cost there. Um, the police department, uh, budgeted for a patrol vehicle and if we're able to get a grant 
then the <coughs> budget, the, it could be more than one vehicle because we would just be providing the match for potentially two or three vehicles. But if we don't get the grant or something happens, we at least have budgeted for one vehicle for this fiscal year. So um, that's in the, the, um, <coughs> the equipment line item for the police department. In the fire department, in the equipment item line item is uh, finished buying air packs. That has been a three-year purchase. We've split that out over the last three years. And we're just going to, well, with the exception of this fiscal year, because we budgeted for the truck, which will be here in May. Um, but we're going to finish that out, and that's budgeted in the equipment line item for the fire department. Um, at that rate, we'll have all new air packs, um, and that will last us for quite a while. Did we not budget for new cars every so many years for the department? Yes. Well, we what we do is we put back, um, if you look on the last or second to last page, um, there's a depreciation schedule mm -hmm. where we put back money for police, fire, and public works equipment. Okay. Um, so we, we do put money back for that. Have you applied for the FEMA grant yet? It's the FEMA the grant. FEMA grant and for the fire department. Have you? It's got a FEMA. Block grant. It's CBD. CBD. Yeah. CBD. Oh. Uh, yes. We well we have a. I'm not sure if the application has been submitted yet or not. I think we're in the process of that right now. Who but that's like that? a two-year. Who? Somebody works with uh, First on Tennessee that? Development District. Okay. That's what I thought, but I thought it was somebody else too. None of that will be in this budget because that, that's that's at least two years out. Okay. Um, let's see. So for public works, uh, we went over the paving, and to kind of circle back to that, if. If the board wishes to look at some of these, uh, like Atlanta, Holston, Walnut, it's possible we could do one or two of those streets and then a section of hand. You know, it's kind of a mix and match thing. So whatever you're, however you want to do that, we've got three hundred thousand dollars set aside for the paving. Um, how much? On how much? And how much on independence? Road wise, mm -hmm. but Carol, would you guys put out there and how far is it going to go? I don't know. I think what Jason would do is looking at because we've already done a section of in, in no independence, yes. Uh, I believe it was last year when they used that emix that would help cut down on the red there. So, I mean, we've already got some sections done like that. Um, I think he would just look for the most problematic section and see what we could do with the funding we have and go that route. The worst part of independence, I mean, I'm sorry, Hammond, is like when you get right up there to the one that can go out of city limits, mm -hmm. there's holes that can constantly They'll fill it in. Two weeks later, it's done worked out. Mm -hmm. And then the county's supposed to take, you know, right there at that one driveway mm -hmm. at Henry. Uh, is, I mean, their driveway, the water comes down the driveway unless it comes on the, the uh, There's quite roads. a bit up there that's got erosion. Yeah, it has. Mm -hmm. And uh, then just right after that, there's a big hole right in Hawkins County, and all that road right there in Hawkins County, we get calls about it. It's just like uh, when we start the road. When we get, when we get, our roads are great, but then you say, well, why can't you do something right there in the harbor, which is where the church is and it goes around, and it's awful. I mean, T, totally awful. I can see how that, I said, you're going to have to call the county on that. 
Yeah, so you might want to talk to the Road Commission or whatever center about that section because that, that it was, it's so, ours looks good and it's good to run, and I go that way when I go to Food City. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's a, through that little wooded area, it's awful. I mean, it's totally awful. Mm -hmm. Pat, if you want to write this number down. Okay. 423. Uh, actually, a cell phone. Let me give you an office number. And this is what the road commission. Good. Uh, how much is that sweet sweet Jason looking at in our house? I'll, I'll get it just like I'm gonna find out. I'm gonna get a cell phone number. I'm gonna get. Okay, thank you. Seeing here's your sweet sweeper. Yes. So the street sweeper is something that Jason has been looking at for a couple of years now. There were some storm water regulations that. <clears throat> came down um, requiring municipalities to have the ability to clean out storm drains. So this is kind of gonna kill two birds with one stone, um, giving us the ability to do that and be compliant with cleaning out the storm drains, but also giving us the ability to use the street sweeper to clean up. Um, I think it looks good, it oh, helps. Yeah. Yeah, I think keep the grass from rolling up in the corner of the ice fall, and yeah. the cigarette buds and all that stuff. I think it'll look good. And what we had been doing is contracting that out like quarterly. We would have them just come and sweep the main roads, um, which if we have a street sweeper, we can do all roads. Yes. But we were just hitting the main roads and then the intersection <coughs> on 11W. But... Um, we did that quarterly, and then we would have special times before events like the uh, fall fest. And I guess we can use it after a storm or like gravel or something like that, just mm -hmm. swiping the roads and stuff like that. Yeah. Get the rooms up. Yeah. So it runs about two hundred and twenty thousand. I put two hundred and thirty just in case. <laughs> so um, it's it's a smaller size, but I think it'll be good and yeah. it'll get get it done for us. I know we've been talking one for years. Yeah. We just never have got one. Yeah. Okay. Uh, he he said that was his biggest need, and so you know I think and he was content with just having one. Well, I can see it also keep people off the road too. You get yeah. a person out there, they're going to have a truck to clean it. Right. Keep them from getting hit, something like that. Yeah. I'm a little confused as far as it taking care of the storm drains. So there's, there's a. I know it will go, the brush will go over the grates. Yes. Uh, the storm water system. But, but the, those grates get clogged up under there. How's that? There's actually like a vacuum attachment that comes off of this one and you stick it in there. Okay. And that's how you clean out what's inside of there. Gotcha. Yeah. 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 Instead of sticking somebody in there, you just stick a hose in there. Yeah. yeah. I'm just about wondering if we should have a screen made that will sit right down on the top of those frames. There's so many regulations with stormwater and what you can and cannot do. So I can't speak to that, but um, I imagine it would take a lot of research to make sure we weren't obstructing anything and potentially. Well, the stuff will stay on the bottom, but on top. Yeah. The only one get the water. We could get one, try it, see how it works. Yeah. If we can buy one, I don't know who makes them. I'm not sure. Um, then Jim will want to make one with a torch. <laughs> so we went through State Street Aid. Uh, that's not the only thing there is we didn't budget for paving in that. We just budgeted for our hot mix and fixing things in house. Um, so that that was significant because it had been cut. Um, the building inspector now that we don't have someone on staff for that and we're contracting it out it looks a little bit different uh we kept the budget pretty much the same just because we have we don't know what it's going to look like yet um it looks like it's probably going to end up being less than what it was with staff but um i just left it the same for this year 
and we'll be paying by invoice for all of that. So we'll see how what that looks like at the end of this year. Do they don't get paid unless there's something here for them to do? Right. They only go out when we call them. And I know monthly payment at all. No. Okay. Yeah, the guy that was just now here, he's the inspector now, right? Yes, yes. Okay. And the way that that will work, or the way it works currently, is you call in for your permit, we take your information, we get him in contact with you, and then he will mm -hmm. notify you what you need to do. If you need a building permit, if you need electrical, or whatever the permitting is that you need, he will have that discussion with you. Um, if it costs and you have to bring in like a physical permit, then they would, the person would then come to City Hall, fill out their permit or bring it in to us and then we would collect the permit fee. Um, in the future, like he mentioned, we're going to have software available online where you can actually go yourself. So if you have a complaint, you can go to our website, you can fill out a, if there's a code complaint, you can actually fill out the complaint. It goes directly to Safe Build. Um, if you want a permit, you can fill out your permit online. It gives you the cost and then you can either pay on <coughs> Sorry. Oh, okay, yeah, I mean, it's going to be really great because, especially on the code enforcement side, because we've never had tracking like that where you get from start to finish, you know, my neighbor has um, dog hoarding, and I'm going to go and I'm going to complain on them. So you fill out the form. It initiates the complaint card. They go out, they investigate, they take pictures. If I want to follow up on it, I can just log back in with the number, my complaint number, and I can look at the pictures. I can see if they've been issued a citation. I can see if they've gone to court, if they've paid, if they've cleaned it up. You get all the information that you want on your end as the complaint per person initiating the complaint. Um, but it also helps us, like if we were to have to go to court or be in front of a, uh, a judge, this is what we've done from start to finish. Here's the proof. They've been notified. You know, you're really covering yourself um, on that, that end. The same with the building permits and things of that nature. Um, it gives the homeowner or the contractor, whoever's getting the permits, a one-stop shop for all of their things too. So they just log in and the system's there and it houses all their information. You can reprint. If you lose your permit, you need to reprint it, you can reprint it. Um, we have not had that in the past. So this will be really, really good. What kind of time frame are you looking on get one of these dudes coming out there to check on something? Six months? What do you mean? You can do it right now? You got a complaint? Well, I doubt that. If you have a complaint, he's going out already. He just has not been able to issue citations yet. So, you know, it's... So if I, if I want to hook up a generator to the house, mm -hmm. and I'm going to call him, how long is it going to take him to come up there and inspect it? He's calling people the same day. <laughs> well, I'm talking about a person coming there and checking it. I'm not talking about a phone call. Somebody's going to come out. I there think and he schedules it. I mean, it's he first, was first off. You have to get your permit to do it. Yeah. And then he'll know, and then you'll tell him when you're going to have it installed, or he should then come up at that time and inspect it. Yeah. That's very easy. Yeah. The, 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 the turnaround time. Though, right? That's yes. the point of using the safe. Yeah. Safe this is not going to. This right is right. probably going to be a faster process. In all honesty, I, I don't think it can get any better than this. I'm not saying bad. I'm not saying bad. I'm not saying bad. <laughs> This because he was physically here doesn't mean that his process was any faster. You still have to go through the process. Yeah, Vince was looking into this already. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. He was. Yeah. So he's on that. He was paying a referring there. He was yes. looking for something to replace him. He was. Yeah. We haven't had any complaints so far, and <laughs> it's probably the luckiest it's ever going to be. <laughs> so um, I think it's going to be a good thing, and I think that it's it's that's what fits the needs of the town at this time, I think. 
But what's going to be the cost for that? We, oh, that's what I was saying. I'm not sure. You didn't give one, so I think, well, you must have something. It's, you pay per time they go out for code or building inspection, and it's just a pay <coughs> for whatever they do. Now, does he live in Johnson City? That's not here. He was even talking to I'm us. I'm not sure. To, what, did he? Chris, did you? I mean, he didn't, he didn't say. say he said well, he kept bringing up Johnson City. Yeah. Okay. Line 479, that's the it's been. I I think there's just 550 in there for miscellaneous. I'm sorry, I'm going to go on 320 okay. operating supplies. What? Operating supplies. Oh, 2,000. Um, that, that, it's just in there. I, I just didn't take it out because I, I didn't want to go too far off of what we had for this fiscal year. So I just left it in there. I mean, we may not even use any of it. And then the stormwater public involvement that stays regardless if, if that person's here. Or I think we need to keep it in there because we will have to, and that this is something that they might potentially be able to help us with. We still have to have a stormwater plan mm -hmm. and someone to manage that plan. So um, we have to put out materials, educational materials and things like that and take surveys. So we want to keep it in there, but um, I don't know if Safefield will be able to do that for us or not, or we may have to explore the avenues of contracting that out somewhere else, but they might be able to do it. So um, I'm, I'm just not sure yet. I haven't figured that one out completely. The goal, Jim, is to try to make the uh, permit fees cover most of the expense that we're going to pay to pay. Mm -hmm. so that's, that's the goal. We'll see how it works. We really won't know until we you find out that have time period. Even if one year of the building activity differs from another, it's going to be very hard to budget you know, a definite figure based upon your prior year. Even. But the, the goal is to make sure it doesn't end up costing us money. It should cost the developer the money to do that, not the town. Uh, unless the town decides they want to supplement and support the developer somewhere. I think well we're gonna try to we're gonna to try to put the cost to the town. You wanna bet on that? I think they'd ask about it. Well, <laughs> bet on it for bad anything. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In regards to I also have one quick question. This is actually in regards to revenues. Did the state the state sales tax holiday, did that have any impact on revenues? Because there was a grocery tax, uh, and I know the grocery tax in here is going to be limited on what we actually collect. But did you notice any changes in revenues I from did. that three month holiday? I did. It took. It takes about two months before you start to see the effects of that because they're about two months behind in giving us our revenues. Um, so I did notice a slight decrease in that. I'm not sure if, do you know if they have determined this year if they're going to do three months again? Okay. Or? I haven't saw any bill or yeah. anything that, was that not done in special call session or was that done in yeah. regular, I have to look back and look, I don't remember. Yeah, I'm hoping, I mean, it's nice, but it does impact our revenues. <laughs> So I've got a question on recreation. Uh, it says two, in 297, joint recreation program, and you've still got $982 in joint recreation uh, director, 40%, $41,810. What's that? Is that in there in case that we go back into the joint? No, the only reason that's showing up is because if you'll look at the first uh, actual budget for fiscal year 22, adopted budget for fiscal year, it's only because of those budgets that that's in there. It's it's empty. There's nothing in there. Okay. Now, where's that money at? It's, it was cut from the budget last year whenever um, we were no longer in there. What that, what that is doing in there since we don't have a... Uh, joint recreation anymore. It's if you'll look at, at the very last column, there's nothing in there, it's just blank. Okay. 
Okay. A lot of them which you still make with it's no fun thing. Right. The, the dark gray one that shows nine months actual shows that you have spent any money on those this year. Correct. And we have uh, still budgeted for the LPRF grant in there. I'm hoping that that will start soon and then we'll work on the park improvements out of that. Well, what's the, um, actually on this page, on that same page, and not that it's a, a problem, just I'm kind of thinking I'd look at it. What's more, uh, what caused the library budget to go up? So this is not per their request, but I felt like we needed to budget for their grants. They've gotten grants over the last two years and we have not budgeted for that. So they've ended up getting really close if not going over their budget. So what I did was I put in, if you look in six nine. Uh, yeah, 619, um, we put the training grant in there, and then there was a little bit of money added to their summer reading program. Is that uh, part of the outdoor? <coughs> and then their wages had actually gone up uh, the re per the request of the regional library director for the state i believe or somebody from the state had recommended to us last year to increase uh the wages there to kind of bring it up to par so we had increased the i obviously the budget had been passed um, but the library board voted for to accept that and so we implemented that and it needed to be reflected in this year's budget well, and that's only and now that I'm actually looking at it closer from the adopted budget to the actual, or for, not from the actual, but to the proposed budget of this year, mm -hmm. that's only an increase of about, what, $8,000 roughly? Yes. So that would have made its effort attached to it? Yes. Yes. Well, when was the little house, not house, but the reading up in the park? The outdoor classroom? Yes, classroom. They're working on getting that done hopefully soon. They just got all of the pieces put together this week. And then Jason's going to go out and kind of anchor everything down. We so still, he's doing a lot. They're doing a lot of work up there, too. They're putting together the desks and the painting easels and benches and the raised garden beds now. You forget about the budget? I do. I think, um, and after talking to our CPA that helps with the finance, preparing the financial statements and stuff, um, you know, he even expressed um, that we have a really healthy budget, things look good for us, um, our fund balance is healthy, and, you know, we're just in a really good place right now. So, um, it's with the budgets, with the budgets from 2022, would that show a fund balance from 2020 on that? Am I saying that's right? Did it show a fund balance on the last page from two years prior? Yes. If at the very last page, you can see the ending. If you look at the uh, ending fund balance that shows the audited numbers. So we've increased quite a bit over the last two fiscal years. Okay, uh, so I guess maybe we'll first my question. If we go back to 2022's budget though, like if we went yes. to 2022's this actual document, yeah. would 2020's number be there? Is that how that would show two years prior? Yes, okay. yes, it would. That's, that's Sorry, I'm with you now. So, yes. Okay. Yes, it I was would be there. I wanted to know like, if we want to see what our fund balance was in 2020, yes. where you would find that. And from seeing that, I'm assuming it would be on 2022's yeah. budget. It'd also be in our audit, our, uh, audit report, too. In the, the, the one that we get every, like, the packet or the bundle yes. that we get at the audit report? Yeah. Okay. It'd be in there, too. For 2020? Yeah. Okay. I've got a 2020 audit I can get for you. Okay. I would like to ask one question. I don't really travel Hammond Avenue that much, mm -hmm. but what 
few times I have. It seems there are areas that would benefit from being widened. Mm -hmm. So can we get entertain that idea? I talked to Jason a little bit about that. I think we kind of hit on that maybe at the last meeting or at some point. I remember you and uh, how does that process normally work? Is there something that the uh, there would be an offering of X amount of dollars for X amount of land parsonage, or is it a I don't want to use the eminent domain word, um, but how does that process normally work if you're looking to acquire that land to widen it? You have to get it appraised, uh, and then you make an offer to the landowner. Landowner, they can accept it or not accept it. If they do not accept it, they can ask the court that the court set the value on it. Um, it's a process where you then have to put the uh, money that you offered into a, into the court. So that that's what we would set aside. It would be a major undertaking, yeah. and I agree here. Hammond yeah. Avenue is is too narrow in many many places. In fact, I was actually having a conversation with one of the landowners there, right at the the old greenhouse there, just up in there with a big oak tree is right there yeah. on the road. You yeah. know? Right. And he's got the same problem. You know, he says, "What do I do? You know, you can't probably do anything." But but we'd only be talking about one of the property. That's, That's true. Yeah, you know, if you get people to agree to it, it's hunky dory, right? But yeah, even then, so you're talking to you know, you're it. talking to punch because so just taking that tree right. down is a thousand bucks there. Okay, yeah. and we're that, yeah. that, pro that process would happen with each deed owner yes. all along the Yes, way. each one, you, you name you, them all in the suit, but yes, you. And it's not as, I mean, it is it's a, a very long year. Like years, yeah, it can, can take because the landowner that goes out and gets their appraisal, yeah. and then you have to right away. Right away, right away. 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 That uh, White House, where that big old tree's at, that's scary right there. Well, I would, like I said, I I would tell you to get an engineer to give you an estimate of the money. My guess, in order to get that parks turn in, that's a blind curve, is the worst yes. part of it. You'd have to cut that hill down and why the hell and stuff. You're talking big bucks, probably. I, mean, I, I would say, if you want to get an engineer to look at it and give you some estimates before you decide to get a million dollars right there. You could have a bunch of money. Yeah, because that, that's a terrible curve. Like I said, yeah. long, the road coming this way, you're turning this way, and it's just. Probably well, there's a wagon road, and they just painted over the years. Yeah. Again, I know, we're, I know we're already like an hour and a half in, but yeah. without, without having a business meeting, do you want to talk about uh, meeting up today at all or the potential? Uh, one thing that we, we have talked about quite a bit. And like John said, I probably won't mention names uh, yet until we kind of know uh, a little bit more of what this is going to look like. But um, Alderman Bear had mentioned a few times about the desire to implement recycling. So I had a meeting this morning, did a few phone calls, set up another meeting for next week to explore potential uh, opportunities for partnerships to get that done. Um, it would look to be in the form of a convenience site with uh, multiple recycling options located there. And um, you know, we also discussed the, the potential of having a, re, uh, a convenience site for large item things, but I still think that that would be um, beneficial to us for the recycling as well so um, it looks very promising and i think we'll be able to set something up with that uh, my recommendation would be for the board to consider if this is something that we really want to pursue um, the potential for purchasing some land to put the convenience site on because i know we talked a little bit about doing something off the of property we already have on uh, independence, independence in the curve there but i think we might need something a little bit more centrally located um, to encourage people to utilize the space and um, and i think
think you know it also gives us the opportunity for some expansion in the future too if we want to put other things on the property in, in addition to the convenience side. Oh, up here on Main Street. Yeah, there's a there's a couple of places for sale right now. But we don't have anything budgeted for that. So if that's something that you all would like to entertain, I would think that we might want to go ahead and designate a certain amount for purchasing or completing this potential project. Um, of course, that would be at your own discretion. And so you said you had a, a meeting again next week? Yes. Another, another phone, or another, just another meeting period next week? Yes. Um, if we could still continue I mean, looking at your budget, the budget's balanced right now. Is there much of a surplus in it at all? Yeah. I think about 15000 So that's something that uh, I think it's definitely worth exploring to continue, you know, with all those bare, you know, we've looked at a few different options, and I think it's a good uh, thing to explore the services. It may even also, also help offset costs of large item pickup. Yes. Um, you know, that's, that's, where, that's where the big, you know, looking at your investment versus return uh, yeah. savings on the your expenditures yeah. could be could offset. So uh, I think that's something certainly worth exploring. But if we don't look at doing it now, budgeting, we're looking at either a budget amendment later mm -hmm. down the road or um, this being delayed by a year. Correct. Yeah. So what? You got a general fund balance, a health general fund balance. I guess before, after you have the next, and this is still kind of very much a hypothetical work in progress, mm -hmm. um, but was that something that you could kind of prepare a few options of what that would look like of how we could budget for it either, either now, kind of the, give us a few options of scenarios. Either we budget for it this way, general fund, um, uh, you know, or we mix this budget up a little bit to better accommodate for it, kind of just what that would look like in a few different ways to let us make the best <coughs> decision that we could because of what this also is doing is uh, expanding services. Right. You know, I think that's something to, uh, important to point out is that, it, you know, you're, you're expanding services. There's always going to be some expense with it, yeah. but how that partnership, how that kind of deal works out with these entities could really make that um, a good venture to go down. Yeah. yeah. I think, I guess, on a a quick answer, which I can give you more details um, in the future, but a quick answer would be we have a capital outlay, a totally separate account with close to $400,000 in it. Um, the funding could come out of that. We also have quite a bit of retained earnings um, anticipated for this year, but also from last year, so we could just take it out of the our um, unassigned fund balance and put it in to our budget this year uh, there's there's options for that uh, i think that we can do it you know out of our i don't think we need a loan or something of this nature um it just be you know if you want to take it out of a capital outlay or out of i think we need to know how much it's going to cost who's going to operate it who put a fence it in? I think there's a lot of figures being put out here before we jump the, jump the gully. Right, but I think all that Alderman Gibson is referencing is do we want to look at purchasing property for this venture? Just, just, I mean, there are a lot of moving pieces, right? Yes. Like that. There's a lot yeah. of moving pieces. Yeah. But there, I mean, there's also, if, you're going to, if we're going to look at it yeah. with, um, with the partnership with the entities, then it's like, here, there's going to be, we're going to have to start with making steps to, to knock off some of those right. list of things. And you know, we, like it's been discussed multiple times, we're going to have a problem with public works eventually. Yes. Um, at land, no, land, land, land expenditure. And I think that's where, you know, we start looking at some of our projects that we have. How do we, how do we check these boxes in different categories? Can we, is there a place that we could put this and have a larger expansion for public works? Right. Mark two of those things off the to-do list. And now we can offer this service, public works have more room. We do it for this price that we can't afford. Mm -hmm. And now we're offering the services for the town, which could also cut down on large item pickup, which is decreasing the expenses there. There's a lot of moving parts to it. 
Yeah. We got 30 acres up there on Independence, right? We own about 30? Not in the waste water plant? Yeah. So yeah but you can't We're about to not be able to use that because yeah, they're going to leave the water sludge. That's a rather full ocean. No, it's not, uh, you can't put things up there at the wastewater plant. It won't be close to it up there, close to it. It'll be down close to the road where everybody can get into it. Well, well, well you're thinking about yeah. what I think, where I think that you're talking about, it's not rocks. It's, it's not going to be safety wise for traffic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're going to go through that steady vehicle, wouldn't you? Yeah. There's not even a road to access That's that side of it. Right. You would have to go through. The only way you can access that property That's right now right. is through the way so the yeah, plant, right. which is not safe, especially right now. We do not want to put traffic going through our wastewater plant, for sure, by all means. But it's just a, something to consider and um, you know, if that's something that you wish to add to the budget, we can do that. It's not in there right now, but it's definitely something we could put in, I think. So you yeah. think we can check it out, see where we're at, what the cost is going to be for it, even before it even goes on the budget. Well, we don't know what, I mean, if you don't, if there's not a, we're not even looking at property right now. But what you would want to do is say, well, we will spend up to this amount for property and the board would vote on that. We would put it in the budget. We may not even find anything. You don't have to spend it just because it's in there. Could you take a look and see what available properties that we do have that would be conducive to what we're trying to accomplish? I mean, there's two off the top of my head right now. Yeah, I mean, there's a few. Well, there are major right here. Yeah, one I'm saying right across from right Glacier. Right here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right across from Blue. The mm -hmm. auto collision, the old house there. The collision office. Yeah, the collision office. Right across from the mm -hmm. right across the road there from them is a lot. It has a house on it. I've never noticed that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can't really see the house because of the grass and weeds. And Everything, but it's there, Jim. I promise. <laughs> well, sorry, this is about long me. Yeah. Are we done? Everybody, that's that all that I have is the budget. Okay. Uh, yeah. we, we can cover yeah. the two things. I'm good. You good? I'm good. Okay. What two things we can discuss? John doesn't want to bring it up. We're done. Motion to adjourn.